Part two, I guess, of the millennial rain kind of tour of different pictures, just some thoughts on it. Starting off with the apocalypse here, they talk about it as, of course, with reference to the Book of Revelation, events predicted, the complete destruction of the world, preceding the establishment of a new world in heaven. But one interpretation they say of the Book of Revelation is one in which the events predicted are said to refer to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 by the Roman armies of Titus. This second view is known as the preterist view of eschatology. Well, I don't know, because perhaps it's that way, but the preterist view to me is a little bit different in some cases. And it's really something interesting that the apocalypse view is just the destruction of the basically the whole world. Now, I showed you how the tree rings in AD, what was it, AD 536? About just under 1,500 years ago, the tree rings for about between two to four or five years in most areas of the world were very, very thin compared to other tree rings. And when you put tens of thousands of trees together and you count back, it's pretty well established that there was almost no growth for whatever reason during that time. And of course, that is right around the end of the so-called ancient times, the end of the Roman Empire that's where you have this layer of black earth, scorched earth over everything. That's where the descriptions of regions change from lush areas to, uh, well, desert. The, the beginning of deserts in almost a third of the world. Deserts existed in ancient times, for sure, but the extent of them wasn't so much, I believe. This is interesting. One world, one war. The reason it's interesting, the flight paths, well, it's the, pro the projection of the map. This is straight out of an atlas. Obviously, the scale is not linear, officially. All right. But when you read what they wrote here, <laughs> the North Polar Sea is essentially the center of our world. To one side is North America. To the other side, Asia and its offshoot, Europe. Triangular continental mass is pointing south towards distant seas and toward barren Antarctica. But then the, the north, the bases of the two triangles almost touch. The Bering Strait, the point of separation in the Pacific, is only 50-odd miles wide. And it is difficult to judge whether Iceland, the stepping stone in the Atlantic, belongs truly to the new or the old hemisphere. Indeed, without a polar sea center, there might be one... Or there might be one globe, but there would hardly be one world. If the continents were equally se equidistantly separated, it would be very possible to have six wars. So anyway, they're saying that it was the advent of flight that led to the World War because it brought all the various theaters together. But this part is interesting here, if you go down. Over 90% of the world's people live in lands north of the equator. It's still true today. Essentially, because it's always been shorter to travel close to the polar sea than to travel around the southern oceans. <laughs> well, okay, this was written before they had this really, really long distance, um, like the long distance flights that we have. But even with our long distance flights, there's no, there's no provision to fly over, over the south. And we think we know why. While it includes obvious distortions which increase toward the south, it serves as an excellent all-over strategy map. It is a continuous map <laughs> that shows the world in one unbroken piece. Hmm. Isn't, the, isn't the South Pole pretty broken? No. Furthermore, it is centered with, within the Great Triangle formed by the world's power centers. The triangle <laughs> with a floating eye in the top or whatever, I don't know. So, these are practical lesson maps. They do not seek or present the globe. They don't, what is it? They don't seek to be encyclopedic or to present the globe as a subject of abstract study. Rather, they emphasize the two long forgotten realities of world geography. Well, yeah. <laughs> the all two, not, not T W O, T O O, are there on the left, the one. Yeah. 
And these things can be found quite a bit. This one I thought was very interesting because it happens to center really close to where I live, and that's why I know. But I think, well, I've already covered it in other videos. But we're, we're talking about the millennial reign, and these are the writings of the protege of the author of Zetetic Astronomy, Samuel Robotham's protege. And so he has these ideas, you know, the dome, the firmaments, waters above, waters below, different ideas spread out like a tent, mapping the earth. This I thought was interesting. Averbury restored, yeah, restored, who knows what it was really like, but I think this may show this idea of the world map being bigger and the procession of the of the equinox over the 25,000 years that would rotate around the wheel, the world clock, that type of investigation that Google Vamas does and some others. That's something that uh, Ewar talked about. So who knows what, what he was thinking when he did this. These are just things left over from his sketchbook, a journal. This I thought was interesting about architecture because we talk about buildings having energy fields around them. But this is a depiction of the new Jerusalem coming down. New heavens, new earth. So, and then that would be like the ziggurat tower of Babel. The, the true ziggurat, not the one that's pictured. I mean, this one's up in the clouds. And I, what's interesting, the scale of it, I hadn't thought about it, but if you made a truly, truly massive, massive scale, you could really build something extremely high, basically making a man-made mountain many times the size of Mount Everest. It would give you the breadth that you would need not to make a, a skinny steel frame building really tall, but such of a wide, basically, earth building spiraling up. It's kind of a reverse mine, like strip mining, but in reverse to, to reach up to the firmament. And maybe that is what they were thinking of doing. I don't know how they could deal with the... Maybe they didn't realize how thin the atmosphere would get up there. I don't know. Who knows how far they actually got along. Look at these other worlds. There's Square World, and there's Ice Castle World, and there's no yeah, sh the No Shell Water World, Blank World, Ground World. He did a colorized version of this, I guess. Polar projection. It shows lands outside there. Interesting stuff. Well, well. Skip through the maps. Vintage California. Old school pictures. Old school pictures. The Fernando Valley. Beverly Hills between the city and the sea. And there, Adams Family. Hill Street and Court looking southwest. 1881. The Bradbury Mansion. Big wheel. Big wheel keeps on toying in. Look at the buildings here. They just show up. They just show up in L.A. They got electric arc lamps, electric street cars. Big old towers that looked so much like these towers all over the world. With the big, I guess, the, the church bells in them, supposedly. They've got their ads, advertising, bicycles. In Tokyo, the tallest building in Japan. Wow. Doesn't look very tall, but it looks like a, ver a very familiar... Tower. Ye olde Japanesey Brixies. Same kind of stuff all over. Vegetarian cafeteria. My gosh, is California ahead of the times. But just look at the magnificence of that. Do those buildings look occupied? I think they're empty, a lot of them. This picture is just unknown. Somewhere in California, sometime in the past, Pacific Electric Company... You can judge by the the dress, the way people dress, that it would be around the turn of the century, maybe slightly after. But that electric train doesn't look all that new. I don't know. The trees are pretty well grown in. That 
building on the outer rim is pretty pretty well established. They have metal railings. I mean, this is indicative of a the kind of a place that's been around for a while. An 1882 photo shows one of the first seven electric street lights installed in Los Angeles. That's how they said it back then. Los Angeles, Los Angeles, is located on the east side of Maine. If you're a spy and some, and you say you're from some city in the United States, and they ask you, "Oh yeah, where did you live? I know I have a cousin lived there, Main Street." <laughs> Usually that that'll work. Walnut Street that might work. Oak Street. An 1882 photo. Yeah, yeah. 1882. But why is it so high? Did they think, I mean, were the electric streetlights like way, way, way more powerful than what we have today? I mean, to be that high up and still work, you need some real power, boy, because of the inverse square law, which they knew about back then. People who <laughs> learn about NASA and the Voyager, that's not. Okay, this stuff doesn't impress me, honestly. You see all this stuff and people give it all this credence and whatnot, but I think it's contrived. I really do. So you can see the other, the graffiti, how easy it is to carve stuff in there. And somebody carved in something, 1836. But in some of the graffiti, the graf I like to pay attention to the graffiti. And I'm not sure that this is it, but I've seen it before where the graffiti is telling you that the stuff there is fake. It's like somebody came in and carved all this bull crap saying that that's what the ancients had carved into the stone, which wasn't true. And people come along later and say, it's it's bullcrap. But oh, that's just graffiti. Well, how do you differentiate between the deeper carvings that are officially what's supposed to be there and the graffiti? Well, the graffiti came afterwards and it's not as professionally well done. Yeah, because they had to sneak in at night to do that. They weren't the official ones doing it. This I thought was interesting. Somebody sent me this and it's actually, it's a funeral. I don't know what. It's a funeral for some Russian big shot. But like the question was, what is this device or what the hell is that thing? And like, is it some ultra technical robot that's going through this like, like classic horseshoe shaped magnet to be de decommissioned to be uh, discharged from war? Look at all the people there. I mean, some of these things might be trees. It's hard to tell, but I think they're people. State funeral of Victor Hugo, 31st of May, 1885. Mm, this may have 31 days. Let me see. You put, the, you know, the old knuckle test. You make two fists and you push your fists together. And you start over on your left hand with your pinky knuckle and you go, Jan and you go knuckle, space, knuckle. And so it's, if it's a knuckle, it has 31 days. So January, February, March. April, May. Yes, May has 31 days, because that's my left hand, middle finger, knuckle. But see, in the middle, where your index fingers are, see, January, February, March, April, May, June, and July has 31 days, and then August has 31 days, and then it goes every other one after that. A little tidbit there if you didn't know that one. Okay, so near, either on or near Yonaguni Island in Japan is this. The right eye is open widely and the left eye is closed. Well, you have to kind of see this. Explorers, Japanese explorers are going along and they find what they think to be just like a giant head. It's like a colossal head. Oh, it says Mexico. I thought I thought this was the one. Oh, it's more like the colossal head in Old Me Mexico. But this is, yeah, this is near Yonaguni Island. Asuka? It, oh, it reminds him of a... Kamishi in Asuka, Japan. So if you piece it back together, it can make the face. Why and how did we make it? Mud Fossil University would have fun with. But, you know, I look at it and it's like, it could. it's weird. It could be one thing, it could be another. You see some evidence for one thing, you see some evidence for another. But this, again, like the Egyptian hieroglyphs, this kind of art just doesn't impress me. The horse is like, the petroglyphs, all they 
all they did, they'd live, eat, breathe, drink, hunting, and then they would draw it. It's like you drawing about your office job. What the heck? All right. You know, I wouldn't have done that when I worked. I wouldn't draw about the office jobs I had. Not much to draw. It's just you're done with it when you leave the place. But yeah, I thought of this head. You know, is it just a, is it artwork or what is this? Is this some kind of a helmet that was just preserved from Titans or whatever? I don't know. But yeah. Horse, oxen, Argon Trail. This is out near, this is in like Washington, the Columbia River area. But yeah, the people talking. <laughs> Graham Hancock uh, talking about they were taken by surprise. On one occasion, the sea level rose almost 100 feet literally overnight. Yeah. So these are some pictures I got from. Local area, Bowling Green State University. Thought it was pretty interesting. It's like it's like a parade, but you know, it's almost like people coming into town. They had all the streetcars, all worked out perfectly, and then in all living memory of like my grandfather and my father, this place was uh, the 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 electric streetcars were perfect. Everybody loved them, and they they just removed them. And they have a drawing, the first store in 1863. But then in every photograph, things are all built up. And there are aerial photographs. It looks like there were airports, but there's no record of them. It's all covered with buildings now. They had these huge mansions they use for infirmaries, asylums, that type of thing. But look at the glass. Like I didn't know they could make that big of a window pane and the reflection things just don't seem really occupied that much it's just kind of i would say almost are just there and kind of taken over and then you can see the grate on the ground the street grate that is indicative of tunnels and like a, a raised level this is in one of the buildings in the university i thought it was interesting that there were these forms and shapes in the I guess stonework, it's supposed to be stone, but did, was it carved that way? Or it kind of looks like things were melted down, kind of absorbed in, like gear wheels or something. Like I don't even know. I don't even know what the explanation is of, about that. Well, I collected some moon myths. Chang E, that was the name of one of these phony moon missions. Moon Rabbit. Celine Luna. Yeah, these t this kind of artwork, I'm not buying it. Oh, oh, okay. So now this is extremely interesting. The pyramid. There is no explanation for this as of yet. How some of the stones are like perfectly formed, and then the other ones are kind of like perturbed, worn down. Like, what's the explanation for this? Was there sand covering it that preserved it from the elements? But see how the stones bubble out? That, to me, indicates heat. That the pyramid withstood a tremendous onslaught of energy, probably in the form of heat, but some kind of electromagnetic energy absolutely hammered the pyramid and stripped it of most of its surface. And I'll explain a little bit more about that soon. But I, th I agree with the notion that these were power stations, and I'll show you why. But when you take uh, heat to stone or concrete, you get the effect where it swells and bubbles out exactly like this. And then it, I think it was like popping like popcorn almost on the outer surface. These are probably under, you know, under something, the fascia, whatever. This may be several layers down that got burnt, but it was so tremendously resilient to the absolutely catastrophic, apocalyptic whatever that happened. Meltdown. Total grid meltdown of the worldwide energy grid, I think. I think it was all interconnected, maybe through ley lines. I don't know any... I'm just... I don't really know how that would work. But just putting things together, it kind of makes some sense, at least as a narrative. It's probably not that, but at least, you know, it's somewhere to start, something to go off of. But the size of these things, but look how halfway through 
the brick above the guy's arm, it starts swelling out. And then the one he's next, the, this next to there, that one, it goes, what, four-fifths, five-sixths, and it's hard to say, five-sixths, the way through the brick, the block, and then it swells out. Then you have these, like, couple knobs there. And then look at the blocks underneath. They're much larger. But why would it be that way? Now, they found that the, there were colors. There are just slight remnants of paint on these. And this was done by somebody to show how he thinks it was originally. Of course, I think it would have been much smoother, but it was red and white. Now, what does that mean? That's indicative of the old power stations. And you can see some of the residue from the red paint or whatever it was on these blocks. And we see that all the time, the red and the white, the red and the white. He found traces of Old Kingdom red paint on the angled outer-facing sections. Was Menkari's pyramid entirely red after construction, with the limestone portion on top entirely painted? If so, it suggests that perhaps the original intent was to use Aswan granite for the entire casing, and the switch to limestone was a last-minute change to mm -hmm. speed up construction. I can't help but wonder if the nickname the Red Pyramid was a tradition for Menkari's pyramid for millennia, and after the pyramids were robbed of their casing and it was no longer... So yeah, I forgot that aspect of it. It was called the Red Pyramid, and and it was a different pyramid, but, but I think they were red and white. But, well, you know, these timelines, I do think it's interesting... You have these empires, and then they all kind of, after Ezekiel, after Daniel, after the captivity, Neo-Babylonian Empire, Nebuchadnezzar, every, all the stuff stops. And then we're talking B.C. here, so it's around 530 B.C. Then you have Zeru, Zeru Babel, and a lot, fewer things happen, you know. But here they have a millennium, Ezekiel, so you have Old Covenant, New Covenant, Tribulation, about seven years, and then a millennium. Well, when was it? Well, yeah. take these timelines with a grain of salt, but that's 70 years of Babylonian captivity, 605 to 536 B.C. I just thought it was interesting, 536 B.C., right? Just It's as a coincidence, even though it's not one-to-one, -one, because if you go back... But then it just happens to be 536 A.D., the year the sun, that the sun disappeared, you know. So that'd be over a thousand years, but, well, 36, wow, 36, and then there's no year one, and then you have 36 here. So take out one, 35 plus 35 is 70, and you have the 70 years. But the 70 years is supposed to be before the 536, not after. Well, anyway... Because I think it's 484 B.C. is what it would be if you had a millennium ending on 536. Now this I thought was interesting. I was re-watching one of my videos about tsunamis, and I had this thing from the Discovery, Educa Discovery Channel Education. Pacific Tectonic Plate, and look at the West Coast. And where is Mexico? What is this? Because this really actually matches a lot of maps. And then the, the plate, the left side of South America, that was land in the past. And then where it reaches out from Central America, east, that's not that far, I think, from Atlantis. I just found it very interesting. And Mark Twain. I'll do it in the voice as was presented in Star Trek The Next Generation by the character actor who played Mark Twain, made him sound like a parrot. I don't think he really sounded like that, Samuel Clemens, but it's fun to do the impression that way. Well, Picard, <laughs> if voting made any difference, they wouldn't let us do it at all. Okay. Oh, the Pantheon. And get ready for a really bad joke. A dad joke, if you will. How, <laughs> how do you get dressed in the Pantheon? How do, how do, they, do, how do they do the Pantheon? Pantheon one leg at a time. <laughs> How do you put your pants on? That's the explanation of it. A crack in the dome of the Pantheon. Well, you look at this square. This blew my mind, this picture, because when you look at the ceiling, you don't think those squares are that big. 
but it's so huge and there's it's so high up. They look like ceiling tiles, like normal size there. But that's a one single pour of concrete. Again, they used a lot of concrete in the artificial harbor of Caesarea. Yeah, see the Pantheon from below? Those squares? They're huge. And yeah, there is other, you know, this older, this is that um, stru Roman structure that's kind of open air because it's all collapsed. It's made with bricks and concrete. And you can see it today. They say, oh, it was built like that or it was unfinished. No, it was finished at some point, I'm sure. It was made by and for people who are not like us. That's in the form. Basilica of Maxentius Constantine. Yeah. And somebody did make a model of it if it were completed, but the size of it is just absolutely immense. Absolutely enormous. And so one of the excuses that they give of why they couldn't do Roman concrete anymore, they say it was they were using the ash from a volcanic eruption that just happened to be just perfect for all that stuff. But I don't think so. I think it was a technology. And they talk about... Uh, I mean, the nave, the nave, so basically like a doorway, okay? 25 by 80 meters. 2,000 2, square meter or 22,000 square foot floor. That's like the size of a factory, you know, warehouse or something. This vast interior space was made for emotional effect. No, sir. Only four columns holding up the uh, porch. It was probably destroyed by the earthquake of 847. They they are aware of it. In 1349, the vault of the nave collapsed in another earthquake. But there's no record. Nobody in Rome that would remember almost anything. But my gosh. Advanced weight-saving structural skill with octagonal ceiling coffers. <laughs> Not that kind of coffer. Well, they made great use of arches. They didn't have the flying buttresses, but they didn't need them either for basically doing the same thing. Could they make something like that nowadays? They would have trouble. They would have a lot of trouble doing it. Oh, so here's the Pantheon in the past. Like it's fenced off, see that? Always fenced off, fenced off. Over on the left, it's fenced off. You don't want to fall down in the gap. Nobody's allowed inside. They just discovered it. They haven't figured out what to do with it. And you can see, where's the street level? I mean, what is this? They artificially built up. They have a fence along the side there. What are these street lamps? Huge fountain. What's going on over here? It looks like they've parked a submarine down a canal on the left side of the Pantheon. <laughs> now, when I say submarine, you may laugh. Ah, uh, but it flooded, boy. Now, this, I don't believe. I mean, it's somewhat believable here with... Oh, hey, look, guys. We were going through basically the jungle of Italy and we stumbled onto this city. We'll call it Rome. It was inhabited by giants. And look at the stuff they left over. Let's make a painting of it and leave out all the buildings around as if they weren't already there. It's all overgrown. The, the epicenter, the, the crux, the crotch of civilization gets abandoned? Doesn't make sense. Look at this. Flea market discovers world's oldest, most valuable building that could never be constructed with modern technology in 2022. With a single poor concrete roof with a hole open in the, si in the, in the top. There's a hole in my head where the rain comes in, you know. But the rain doesn't come in. It evaporates before it hits the floor. It's just a, an ingenious design. It allows light in. It doesn't, doesn't even, it's not even drafty. It's just incredible. What happened? What happened, guys? Did you build this? I mean, you go back in time. The further in, back in time, the less likely it is they could build it from the sense of history that we have, and we couldn't build it today. But look at the size of that opening in the top, and 
if you stood under it when it was raining, it has to be pouring rain for you to even feel a drop. I'll, I'll go back. I went through some of these pictures really fast. I think we already looked at that one. Looks like there's a streetcar or something on the right there, but what did they do? Scratch out whatever's written on the top or blur it? It's obscured. I just don't believe that that space inside the triangle of, of the overhang would be left without anything written on it. When they say something was written on it. They didn't know what to do with the place when I read about it. Over the years, you know. At about 142 feet in diameter, the Pantheon's dome is bigger even than the dome of St. Peter's Basilica. It's also completely unreinforced. There's no rebar in there, folks. That makes it the single largest unreinforced concrete dome in the entire world. And yes, it was built by the Romans in 125 AD, not later, not by later architects. Yeah, of course. I mean, they couldn't do it. And it's huge. You saw the size of those squares. Uh, they call it the Pantheon. Supposedly, people worshipped all these gods or whatever. That's what I learned. You know, the Romans had all these gods. But actually, as thoroughly studied as it is, they don't know what it was used for. Well, they think they know it was a pagan temple, but to worship which gods is anyone's guess? Cassius Dio. Rainbow in the dark. No, that's a different Dio. Cassius Dio writing in just 75 years after the Pantheon was reconstructed. Excuse me. Reconstructed. Wasn't sure what it was for. It has this name. Perhaps it received among the images which decorated it the statues of many gods, including Mars and Venus. But my own opinion of the name is that because of its vaulted roof, it resembles the heavens. Wow. Yeah, they, they found it, and then they kind of reconstructed it, and then they stuck some statues they found scattered around the area in there, and then said, oh, it's a pantheon. A pantheon, that's what we call it. What is it? a pantheon? Oh. There's the octagonal little booths out there by the fountain, the, the phallic, phallic fountain. It's still there. But again, you know, it... It's where's the street level, you know? I guess is there a little canal there officially? Is that water down there? Well, I tell you what, it floods up, boy. So this is a mid 1800s photo of the Pantheon, mid 1800s it says. And look at the quality of that photograph. Is that horse and buggy really there? Or did they just plop that in there? I don't know. Pantheon of Agrippa, they say. Do you think that they scratched out whatever was there or what? Above the writing? Look at that. They definitely scratched something out. I don't know what it said. The world may never know. Well, that's my last slide. I'm going to end it here. So this is kind of the part two of the look back at 1,500 years, somewhere in there. Between 500 BC, 500 AD, or 1500, I don't know. Somewhere in there is a thousand years of who knows what. But thank you for watching and listening. I'm UAP. I'll catch you later. Bye-bye.